On his 80th birthday in 1890, a U.S. Army interpreter of the Cherokee language named John G. Burnett recounted the horrors that still haunted him from the time he spent driving indigenous people away from their homeland on the Trail of Tears more than 50 years before. I saw the helpless Cherokees arrested and dragged from their homes and driven at bayonet point into the stockades, he wrote. And in the chill of a drizzling rain on an October morning, I saw them loaded like cattle or sheep into 645 wagons and started toward the west. He noted that despite the cold, many of the people had been driven from their homes without shoes on and had no blankets. Burnett continued, the trail of exiles was a trail of death. They had to sleep in the wagons and on the ground without fire. And I have known as many as 22 of them to die in one night of pneumonia due to ill treatment, cold, and exposure. Under these grueling conditions, the Cherokee traveled at least 10 miles a day, most of them on foot, with only the very old and very young allowed to ride in the wagons. Burnett wrote that by the time they reached what was called Indian Country in late March, some 4,000 of the 16,000 Cherokee people forced to relocate had died on the journey. Hundreds more would die soon after they arrived. Reflecting on the part he had played in the so-called Indian removal, otherwise known as the Trail of Tears, Burnett wrote, Murder is murder, whether committed by the villain skulking in the dark or by uniformed men stepping to the strains of martial music. Murder is murder, and somebody must answer. You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting's assistant editor, Megan Liscombe, and today I'll be joined by associate editor Leah Silverman, with a little help from John Karaski to talk about the Trail of Tears when the federal government ripped some 60,000 Native Americans from their homes between 1830 and 1850, forcing them off their land, leaving thousands to die in agony. Throughout the episode, we'll be playing recordings of songs that were written by Five Nations people during and after their harrowing journey to the West. I Cherokee warrior and leader Major Ridge said, They are strong and we are weak. We are few, they are many. We can never forget these homes, I know. But an unbending iron necessity tells us we must leave them. I would willingly die to preserve them, but any forcible effort to keep them will cost us our lands our lives, and the lives of our children. There is but one path to safety, one road to future existence as a nation. Over the centuries following European colonization of the New World, Native American lands were whittled down to reservations scattered throughout the United States. But before they were forced off of their land and into these small designated areas, five tribes inhabited the southeastern states of Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, and Florida, the Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, Seminole, and Choctaw peoples. White settlers had long coveted these Native Americans' lands and regarded the indigenous people as a roadblock on their path to expanding the United States. At first, the U.S. government put forth a policy of civilization— Proposed by Thomas Jefferson, the Civilization Plan would integrate the Native Americans completely into white European society by erasing their original culture and customs. Jefferson and many other, quote, enlightened men at this time believed that Native Americans were, quote, stunted and savage, but that they could be saved if they would convert to Christianity, learn to speak, read, and write in English, and participate in commerce and private ownership of the land. These five southeastern tribes more or less accepted certain civilizing measures in an attempt to peacefully coexist with white settlers and keep their lands. Many of these people began to wear European-style clothing and traded with white settlers. Some converted to Christianity and even owned black slaves. 
In spite of their efforts to assimilate, in 1823, the Supreme Court ruled that indigenous people could legally occupy land within the United States, but added the distinction that they could not hold the title to that land, claiming that the indigenous tribe's right of occupancy was not as great as the settlers' as, quote, right of discovery. Then, with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, President Andrew Jackson showed that Native American efforts to fit into white settler culture had done little to secure their place on their lands. Jackson wanted more land for growing cotton on a larger scale, as he believed that this would bring prosperity to the region. The Indian Removal Act gave the president the power to negotiate what he called, quote, removal treaties, granting land west of the Mississippi River to the indigenous tribes of the southeast in exchange for leaving their ancestral lands. Speaking to Congress, Andrew Jackson called the act a, quote, benevolent policy and compared the coming forced migration of Native Americans to the journeys that white settlers had chosen to take to reach America, saying, quote, how many thousands of our people would gladly embrace the opportunity of removing to the West on such conditions? But the cold, hunger, death, and disease the Native Americans endured on the Trail of Tears would make sailing across the Atlantic on the Mayflower look like a luxury cruise. The French philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville, best known today for originating the idea of American exceptionalism, wrote this after witnessing an 1831 migration of the Choctaw. It was then the middle of winter, and the cold was unusually severe. The snow had frozen hard upon the ground, and the river was drifting huge masses of ice. The Indians had their families with them, and they brought in their train the wounded and sick. With children newly born and old men upon the verge of death, they possessed neither tents nor wagons, but only their arms and some provisions. The Choctaw people, who by this time primarily lived in what's now Mississippi, became the first tribe to sign a removal treaty in September 1830. But though the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek was framed in diplomatic language, the Choctaw only signed under extreme duress. European-style law and written treaties in particular mystified the Choctaw, who had no written language before the settlers arrived. So they had signed a series of treaties prior to the removal that set them up at a big disadvantage when it came time to negotiate in 1830. For example, a 1786 treaty they had signed in hopes of holding off American aggression gave Congress the power to administer over the tribe's affairs in whatever manner they saw fit despite the fact that they were not considered citizens and were not allowed to vote. Additionally, Andrew Jackson sent his Secretary of War, John Eaton, and a high-ranking colonel to negotiate with the Choctaw, and these men impressed upon the tribe that America's military might would come down on them should they refuse to sign the treaty. And according to historian Grant Foreman, as many as 50 tribal leaders and, quote, favored members had been bribed to sign. So, although the majority of the Choctaw opposed the treaty, they ultimately signed, as they feared that war with America would destroy their people. Choctaw Chief George Harkins explained the decision in an 1831 open letter to the American people, saying, We were hedged in by two evils, and we chose that which we thought the least. He also emphasized that though the removal was framed by the government as a choice that his people had made, the Choctaw felt they had no choice but to comply. The military arranged for the Choctaw to leave their land in three separate migrations. Some 15,000 tribe members and an estimated 1,000 slaves made the long journey to Oklahoma on foot, with the first group traveling during an exceptionally harsh winter and another group making the trip during a cholera epidemic. Along the way, people subsisted on rations of just a handful of boiled corn, one turnip, and two cups of hot water a day. An estimated 2,500 Choctaw people died on the Trail of Tears. Though there are few firsthand contemporary accounts of the Trail of Tears by Native people, Many accounts of this horrible journey were passed down through families and later recorded by historians. In 1937, a Choctaw woman named Effie Oaks Fleming shared her grandmother's story of the forced migration. Her grandmother had been just eight years old at the time, 
and recalled seeing soldiers kill children who were too big to be carried along the trail, but still too small to walk all day. She said, quote, the drivers of the ox wagons would just take them and swing them against a tree and knock their brains out and leave them by the roadside like a dog or a cat and not bury them. So, though she was still a child herself, she helped her family carry her four-year-old brother as she was terrified that he would be killed. And sadly, the long journey along the Trail of Tears had only just begun. The Creek tribe, who lived in what's now Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, were the next tribe to sign a removal treaty. The Treaty of Cassetta was signed in 1832, granting 5 million acres of Creek land to the United States in exchange for $350,000 and land tracts for any Native people who wished to remain. A majority of the Creek people opposed the treaty and many chose to stay, though several groups did migrate voluntarily after it was signed. Those who remained had to contend with white settlers squatting on land that was supposed to belong to tribes people, while the government looked the other way. Additionally, many Creek people were tricked into selling their land for absurdly low prices by unscrupulous settlers. The tension between the Creeks who remained and the settlers who coveted their land led to what's known as the Second Creek War in 1836, as indigenous people who were fed up with the unjust treatment they'd received attacked plantations in Alabama and the village of Roanoke, Georgia. Andrew Jackson retaliated by ordering the removal of all Creek people. He had them rounded up and forced them to march to the Indian Territory in Oklahoma, with the tribe's warriors making the long trek in chains. Nearly 20,000 Creek people were forced to leave their homes, and an estimated 3,500 of them died along the way. One Creek man would later tell historians, quote, My grandfather told me he made the trip barefoot and often left bloody footprints in the snow. But when the Creek people reached the Mississippi, some of them staged a rebellion against American soldiers and refused to board the ship that was to carry them across the river. To quell the revolt, any Creek who showed signs of rebellion was killed. According to the story, quote, Some of them that were left unharmed said, Even we will die here, but not by guns. With this, they took hold of one another's hands and stepped off into a large suck hole that was in the river and went to their death singing a song. It's said that at times, the singing of the Creek people who leapt to their deaths can still be heard at that point of the river. In Florida, indigenous people known to white settlers as the Seminole likewise resisted removal efforts. They called themselves the Yatsiminoli, meaning unconquered people, and were made up of various bands of indigenous people from different tribes. In the decades leading up to removal, some Creek people who'd previously been driven off their land had come to live on this land, and a number of fugitive slaves had been integrated into the tribe as well. So while the white settlers regarded the Seminole as a homogenous group, they were actually quite diverse. What united them was a desire for freedom. Before the Indian Removal Act, the Seminole had signed an 1823 treaty that entitled them to stay on specific reservation land in Florida for the next 20 years. However, by 1832, Andrew Jackson was more than ready to renege on that promise. He sent a diplomat to negotiate a new treaty with the Seminole, which would require them to leave their land and turn over the runaway slaves who had joined the tribe to American authorities. The Seminole initially refused to sign this treaty, but in 1833, they were coerced into signing a very similar one called the Treaty of Fort Gibson. However, they would later deny that they had signed any treaty at all. A claim that's difficult to prove or disprove due to the fact that minutes weren't kept during the supposed negotiations. Despite the treaty, the Seminole refused to leave their land, and the longest war of Indian removal began. The fighting lasted from 1835 to 1842 and cost the U.S. government nearly $40 million. It was also the only Indian war in which the Navy and Marine Corps fought alongside the Army. 
And all of this was done to force somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 people off the land they called home. Throughout the years of fighting, groups of Seminole people were captured and either killed or sent out west on the Trail of Tears, where, like the Creek and Choctaw people before them, they suffered disease, hunger, and death. In the end, an estimated 700 Seminole people and 1,500 U.S. troops died in the war, and some 3,000 people were relocated to the Indian lands in Oklahoma. But about 500 Seminole people stayed behind in the Everglades, and the government actually gave up on trying to get these stragglers to leave. To this day, the Everglades Band of the Seminole says they're the only federally recognized tribe who never signed a peace treaty with the United States and who never surrendered their sovereignty. A concerned citizen who identified themselves only as a traveler from Maine wrote into the New York Observer in 1839 to share their eyewitness account of the Cherokee removal. We found the road literally filled with a procession for nearly three miles in length. The sick and feeble were carried in wagons, multitudes go on foot, even aged females apparently nearly ready to drop in the grave were traveling with heavy burdens on the sometimes frozen ground with no covering for feet. They buried 14 or 15 at every stopping place. By the time the Cherokee were forced off of their land in 1838, they had already made great changes to their nation in order to accommodate the encroaching settlers. Recognizing that a great and terrible change was coming, they established their own written language, many converted to Christianity, they launched a newspaper, and created their own constitution. The Cherokee had also engaged in numerous negotiations with the federal government in order to keep as much of their land, which extended from northwestern Georgia to Tennessee, Alabama, and North Carolina, as possible. So when the state of Georgia discovered gold in their territory and made moves to uproot them in 1828, the Cherokee Nation attempted to beat the white man at his own game and took the state to Supreme Court. Leading that charge was John Ross, a half-Scottish and one-eighth Cherokee chief with a formal education and a complete loyalty to his people. When Jackson had convinced thousands of his people to move west in 1822, Ross held fast with the remaining 16,000. And when white Georgians attempted to evict them in 1830 following the passage of the Removal Act, Ross sanctioned a raid on their settlement and approached the United States Supreme Court at the opening of their 1831 session, demanding that they invalidate Georgia's removal laws. Two years later, the United States Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional for Georgia to attempt to evict the Cherokee themselves, and that only the federal government had the power to do so. But the state ignored that ruling and continued to pursue Cherokee land anyway. Meanwhile, the Cherokee Nation itself split between those, like Ross, who refused to sign a removal treaty and those who felt it in their nation's best interest to do so. So when Jackson failed to entice Ross with $3 million for his people to relocate, he offered $5 million to the group of leading Cherokees who were willing to sign a removal treaty. The so-called Treaty of New Okoto was signed in December 1835, yet Ross continued to fight against the decision for two years. Finally, in 1838, U.S. troops descended upon the remaining 16,000 Cherokee peoples in Georgia. The Cherokee were first forced into a holding camp before they were marched en masse in the dead of winter to Oklahoma. Those who attempted to flee the camp or the ensuing march were shot dead. Those in the camps were subjected to sexual assault, dysentery, and malnutrition even before they were driven on their brutal 1,200-mile march. Approximately 4,000 of them died on the trail. The Chickasaw were one of the last of the five tribes to move, and to this day the indigenous nation takes a little pride in at least having ceded their ancestral lands largely on their own terms. Where the Cherokee adopted through assimilation, the Chickasaw accepted the great and terrible change by selling their lands and planning their own removals around favorable weather conditions. Prior to their mass exodus starting in 1837, the Chickasaw ceded their land in Mississippi and Alabama twice to the federal government in exchange for money. But as the Chickasaw did so, the governments of Mississippi and Alabama took advantage of them, 
grazed on their land without permission and outlawed their form of government. Frustrated, the Chickasaw approached the federal government, who refused to act on their behalf. In 1830, the Chickasaw reached an agreement with Jackson that they would leave their Mississippi lands if they could first survey and select which western territories they would move to. The government agreed, but shortly after their first recon mission, the Chickasaw declared that none of the lands west of the Mississippi were suitable for their people. But as the Chickasaw deliberated on what to do next, settlers continued to harass them in Mississippi territory. Again desperately pressed, the Chickasaw declared to the government, quote, The Chickasaw Nation find themselves oppressed in their present situation by being made subject to the laws of the states in which they reside. Being ignorant of the laws of the white man, they cannot understand or obey them. Rather than submit to this great evil, they prefer to seek a home in the West, where they may live and be governed by their own laws. And so, in 1832, the Chickasaw entered into the Pontotoc Creek Treaty, whereby they ceded their land east of the Mississippi River in exchange for protection from settlers as they searched for a new home. Unlike other tribes, the Chickasaw would fund their own removal and were able to schedule it around good weather conditions. Then, in 1836, the Chickasaw purchased the land that previously belonged to the Choctaws from the federal government. They paid the Choctaws $530,000, equal to more than $12 million today, for the westernmost part of their land in Arkansas Territory. They then embarked on their Trail of Tears between 1837 and 1838 to their new nation, Old Choctaw Territory. 4,914 Chickasaws and their 1,156 slaves emigrated there, and they received over $3 million from the sales of their Mississippi allotments. The Chickasaw Trail of Tears is largely considered to be the least traumatic of the removal journeys of any of the so-called five civilized tribes though the damage wrought to their indigenous power structures and traditions persists today, nearly two centuries later. In the two decades of the Trail of Tears, 60,000 Native Americans and thousands of their black slaves were displaced, and as many as 20,000 of them died in the process. Since their forced exodus to Indian country westward, indigenous tribes have been fighting for their sovereignty. Legally, the U.S. Constitution recognizes Indian tribes as distinct governments, and they have, with a few exceptions, the same powers as federal and state governments to regulate their internal affairs. However, the United States government has continually found ways around this constitutional right and stifled the autonomy of indigenous peoples. In fact, most Native American land is held in trust by the United States, meaning that Native Americans have little control over their own borders. The United States government also regulates the economic and political structures of tribal governments, and tribal governments have been struggling to maintain criminal jurisdiction over their own people who have committed crimes in, quote, Indian country. But in July 2020, the Supreme Court ruled in a landmark decision that crimes committed by Native Americans in most of eastern Oklahoma can only be prosecuted by federal or tribal courts and not state ones, thereby recognizing tribal sovereignty and weakening the power of state laws over indigenous peoples on their own land. But the battle for sovereignty continues, despite these small victories. And despite their deep ancestral connection to the land and their continued existence on it, only two tribal nations, the Cherokee and Choctaw, have the right to send non-voting members to the United States House of Representatives, which makes decisions and regulations around their own lives. However, the Cherokee did not appoint its first delegate until 2019. Though the Trail of Tears was legitimized by a series of inhumane and exploitative laws, it is today largely considered to be a genocide. Indeed, when European settlers first arrived in the Americas, historians estimated that there were over 10 million Native Americans, but by 1900, their estimated population dwindled to under 300,000. Incredibly, their numbers have risen since then, and there are now 2.78 million Native Americans in the U.S. But settlers committed cultural genocide, too, by whitewashing the histories of indigenous cultures and forcefully assimilating or converting them to their ideologies. <laughs> 
American historian David E. Stannard summed up the 500-year war on the Native Americans by saying, quote, The destruction of the Indians of the Americas was, far and away, the most massive act of genocide in the history of the world. Thanks for listening to History Uncovered. I'm History Uncovered's producer, Kit Westneat. If you like the show, help others find us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to follow the All That's Interesting and History Revealed pages on Facebook and Real History Uncovered on Instagram. Make sure you don't miss out on the new episodes and subscribe to the History Uncovered podcast. And keep up with our latest stories at allthatsinteresting.com. If you have a question about the show or just want to say hi, feel free to call us at 929-526-3029 or email us at podcast at allthatsinteresting.com. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like Legends of the Old West and Redacted History. Until next time, keep exploring.